hopefully you become young again and probably pay, play in the IPL. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll take the money. Don't worry, I'll take the money. <laughs>
what was it, the key moment, actually probably 78, um, was one of those summers I'd been away in Australia all winter, or most of the winter, and came back from there in a very confident mood to start the new season back in the UK. I played for the MCC against Pakistan, I played for England against Pakistan in the one dayers, and got 100 at the Oval in the third, I think, of those, the final one of those, and that led to the test call-up. So that is your, yeah, that, that was the key season, to get in, and then to get runs, so six test matches that summer, three against Pakistan, three against New Zealand, 100 against New Zealand at the end. And you think at that stage that you have done enough to stay in that side for a while. Obviously, when you look back, you know there will be ups and downs. As I said, there will be good days, bad days. Yeah. Um, that was a pretty good start. The tour in the winter in Australia went well. Um, then we had a, you know, it, it's, then you realise that you know, not everything is always going to be sweet, this light and roses. So um, there are knockbacks, there are setbacks, and there are times you kind of forget how to play, times it all seems to work far too easily, and those are the ones you prefer to remember. Absolutely. At times when the good days are there, it's, it's about how to make those good days the best ones to make yeah, it I count. Mean, you're absolutely right. And I mean, every, every coach um, in any era and anyone with any experience of the game will try and pass on exactly that. I mean, I, I have sort of friends and colleagues, of course, from my playing days. One of the best examples I can quote is Graham Gooch, my you know, so almost exact contemporary, um, who learnt the secret of basically putting himself out there at 100% each and every day. But he learned that halfway through his career. Um, when I first played with him at late 70s, we were very similar in many, many ways. Um, had a lot of fun on the field, had a lot of fun off the field. Um, we managed to combine the two reasonably successfully, but his career took off and improved and became remarkable when he went, as it were, to use that word, more professional, when he sort of worked out how important it was to him as an individual to give of his best every day. I mean, I, I always have to confess to that human element coming back in again, as well, you know, days, good days, bad days, where some days you literally get out of bed thinking, I'm not really sure I want to do this today, uh, which is not a great thing for a professional sportsman. You know, the great, the greats in any sport, somehow, right. even if they start like that, and this is this is something I had to had to work on now and again. But yeah, I honestly confess this. You know, there are days when I didn't feel like it, where you have maybe I don't know 30, 40 minutes when you to get from home to a cricket ground. You've probably got an hour and a half of that cricket ground to get loose, do a bit of training, do some catching practice, hit a few balls, get ready for the game. And if at the start of the day, at 11 o'clock, um, you're still not quite ready, then you know you've got a problem. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, if you, and if you have to, yeah, if, if at that stage, you're then walking out with pads on, gloves on, bat in hand, and you're still not quite ready, you know you've got a problem. Um, so I used to have to work at that quite hard sometimes. But on the good days, you know, just things slotted into place. And even on those bad days, sometimes if you could survive for, say, 10, 15, 20 minutes, then you know the the juices will start to flow and you think yeah i'll be fine today i'll be, I'll be okay you know let's get some runs absolutely and let's talk about one place where it becomes a little difficult for england to actually make it count i'm talking about india mm -hmm. your your first tour was in 1980 when uh, you came to india tell me one thing uh, whenever english team comes to play in india is it something like they are playing against 11 players on the ground and billions in the stadiums and in their homes hoping for India to win the game? Um, yes, but that's also, I mean, that's probably very true because um, especially back in those days, you know, that 1980, that was the Jubilee Test Match in Mumbai. And in those days, Test Match grounds in India were full. Um, right. And so you had, you know, for instance, in the Wankhede Stadium, you probably had sort of 50, 60,000 that time for certainly all the first three days, three or four days. And therefore, you, yeah, of course you realised that there were you know, 50,000 people crying for India, shouting for India, urging India on. Um, but that creates an atmosphere. And I've always said to people that whether you're going to India like that, or whether you're going to Melbourne, say, Australia, where, uh, you know, the traditional Boxing Day Test match in Melbourne, which is normally when the Ashes are played, for instance, or when India play yeah. Australia there, it'll be 80,000, 90,000 people. And of those 80 or 90,000 people, 79,990 in the good old days were on Australia's side. So, you know, you're used to playing and you know, in the West Indies in the 80s. You know, it was the, the, the whole thing has changed completely now. In the West Indies, in Barbados, 
small ground, 10,000 people maybe if you're lucky, but you know, 9,990 were Bajans looking for the West Indies to do well. So the test is this. If you walk out in any of those cricket grounds away from home and you know the crowd is on the side of your opposition, if you react well to that, if you think, yeah, great, this is a challenge, um, I'm going to show them, uh, then you're in the right job. If you think, oh, I'm not sure I want to be here, then you're in the wrong job. It's a very simple equation. And right. I mean, for instance, Melbourne, I've, I've made hundreds at Melbourne in that Boxing Day test match, at least once anyway. Uh, and that's a very special feeling. Um, I suppose, actually, if I look back at my career, one of the slight gaps, although I got a double hundred against India uh, at Edgbaston very early on in my career, the number of runs I actually got in India doesn't quite tally up. So if I could start again, that's one of the things I would put right. <laughs> Hopefully you become young again and probably pay, play in the IPL. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll take the money. Don't worry, I'll take the money. <laughs> okay, let's. since you have introduced Australia, let's talk about the Ashes. Because whenever mm -hmm. I talk about Ashes with the English journalist, they always regard it over World Cup. So, what does it feel for the English cricketers to play in Ashes and you being the captain and led the side to victory and having seen the sport so closely, what does Ashes mean to England? Uh, yeah, I mean, you're right, to, you're right to say it's very special. Uh, and that is all down to the very, very long history. There's only one international contest for all those pundits out there that predates the Ashes, and that's the USA against Canada that was played, I think, in something like 1844 in New York. Um, so the Ashes has the longest history amongst the, as we use the expression, proper cricket nations, you know, the full cricket nations. Right. And I think every time when I first played in Ashes, which in my first Ashes tour was 78, um, it wasn't, you know, it was a time of Kerry, uh, Kerry Packer's World Series, so it wasn't quite the full Australian 11. We played that, yeah, we played them the following year, and then I mean, I think I played in something like eight Ashes series overall, um, and came out pretty much sort of even for each, something like that. But every time you do that, the first time especially, but every time you do that, you are aware, as an English or Australian cricketer, of that immense history of Don Bradman of Keith Miller, of Len Hutton, of Wally Hammond, of, you know, going back as far as W.G. Grace, you know, you're and every time, the first, first time I walked into the, should we say, the dressing rooms at the Sydney Cricket Ground, I sort of looked around thinking, hmm, you know, there have been some fantastic, great players who've been in these exact same rooms, feeling nervous, wondering about what's going to happen, you know, in the next five days. And when I walk out, you, you out of the old, well, out of the city dressing room, you walk out of the door, turn left a bit, down through the crowd, onto the field. And if you look back, you've still got the Victorian Pavilion. So it's a bit, you know, of all the grounds that have probably changed so much over the years, Sydney retains a little bit of that something with the old pavilion. You know, Lords is the most fabulous ground because it has that pavilion, which has been there for, you know, it seems like forever. And so Absolutely. the same thing happens there, you know, when players come to the Lords, when when, we, when, we, when I first went to Lords to play a county game and then my first test match at Lords, you'd look around that room thinking about all the players who have been in there before and have you know, walked out to do their best out on the field. So the Ashes has that absolute history. I mean, the Little Urn is the most famous trophy in cricket. Um, when I yeah. stood there at the Oval in 1985 as a winning captain, it was a very, very special moment. When I stood there four years later as a losing captain, it was a very desolate moment. Um, and that is, you know, that is the absolute contrast because yeah. of the importance of the Ashes. I mean, we've we've managed to say, I mean, last last summer, of course, was, was fascinating for all sorts of reasons. Um, and people were asking at the start of last summer, I'm sure you're aware of this, in this country were saying, in England were saying, what was, the, you know, if you had a choice, which would you rather win, the Ashes or the World Cup? Um, and you're not allowed to say both, of course. Um, and a lot of people said, please, 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 can we just win the World Cup once? Because we've tried a few times, We've never succeeded yet. You know, in 40 years, 40 years plus of the history of the World Cup, you know, we've come second a couple of times, knocked out in semi-finals a few times, had some abject tournaments here and there where we never even looked like qualifying. Um, and so actually people were very, very glad, I'm sure, that we managed even by the merest margin to, to win that World Cup last year. And of course, I mean, I can go, I mean, I can sort of tell you about, for instance, the, the 83 World Cup where we were at home here in England. Um, I've right. had a great series so far. We've been fantastic. Cricket. Guess, guess who we lost to in the semi-final? Right, India. Yeah. And we played, you know, and we played 
We played, I think we played at Old Trafford. And I say we were very confident because we played such good cricket for the previous, I don't know, four, five, six weeks, whatever it was. Um, and, you know, we, we thought, you know, we, well, we knew we could beat India. But if I say it was the sort of pitch, it was all kind of an Indian pitch. It was a little bit slow, a little bit low. Um, and we just, we just didn't play very well. India did, did all the right things. And, of course, then went on to famously pick up the trophy a few days later by beating the West Indies. And I have to say, I wouldn't have been confident of us beating the West Indies at Lords unless we'd had just those magic moments that, for instance, India had on the day. So that was actually that was probably the most important series for India in Absolutely. terms of their one day in terms of their one day cricket. You know, fabulous reputation, of course, in Test match cricket for a long, long time. But in terms of believing that one day cricket was important, when they'd actually, you know, when Capital was holding up that um, World Cup you know, to the crowd at Lords, that was a, an absolute turning point. Absolutely. And since you have mentioned about World Cup and as far as my, my counting and mathematics go, I think it's exactly 44 years as much mm. as uh, England took to have their hands on the World Cup trophy. If you yeah. had to pick one thing, what do you think it took England so long to get there? Because they are the creators of the game. You cannot take anything from that. Uh, yeah, if, it was, if we were building an app in 1975 when the first World Cup happened, if we were in charge of building that app, we'd have had to put something in somewhere, a little sort of little something in there which says that you know, we must win this World Cup soon. You know, it's our World Cup. We need to win it. After that, it's a free for all. Um, but cricket, of course, doesn't work that way. And when one, one of the things it very obviously proves is that you know, on that day, at that moment, you have to get things right. And I mean, for instance, I played in the World Cup final in 79 against the West Indies where we were um, you know, West Indies were obviously favourites um, and there was a moment you know, early on the first hour and a half we were very much in the game. Um, we then watched the brilliant Viv Richards and on his day the brilliant Collis King change the course of the game and then we had a lot of runs. You know, by the standards of the day, even though it was 60 overs, had a lot of runs to make and we got it wrong. So you, know, you come up against, you know, you've suddenly got you know, the last few overs beckoning and you've got to up the scoring rate and you've got Joel Garner, six foot eight, 90 miles an hour even on a flat pitch becomes a bit yeah, a bit tricky so we we you yeah, know we knew we probably knew we were going to come second there then you don't get to a final for a while um then there was the what was it the 87 final in pakistan where we were beating australia uh we, we were on course to beat australia and david why did you travel to 87 world cup uh, what what to the to england or to the 87 world cup well i mean 87 World Cup, again, you, you, you know, we're playing this time, obviously, overseas. Um, and England, you know, OK, it's England-Australia in the final. And in those days, I was actually having a, a winter off, so I wasn't involved in that particular World Cup. Uh, but I was in a BBC television studio back in London, watching at some ungodly early hour because of the time difference. And when my long-term friend and colleague, Mike Gatting, played the reverse sweep off Alan Borders bowling and miscued it, that lost the World Cup. You know, yeah. up, Mike at that stage, he was a very, very fine player, was manoeuvring the whole thing. He had it under control. Um, and he just, you know, that one little decision, which, you know, nowadays, of course, you know, everyone plays the reverse sweep um, in their sleep. You know, it's, it, it's, it's almost dull because, you know, we're so used to it. In those days, it was relatively unusual. Um, and if you get it right, fine. If you get it wrong, like any, in fact, like any cricket shot, let's face it, you know, whether yep. you're playing the most orthodox cover drive, um, you know, whatever you're doing, if you get it right, fine. If you get it wrong, that's it. That's your moment gone. So that was England's moment gone in 87. I was then commentating in Australia in 92. So I watched that whole tournament in Australia, New Zealand in 92, working for Channel 9. Had a fantastic time. Learned a lot about broadcasting. Great to be with the greats like Benno, Ian Chappell, Greg Chappell, Bill Laurie. You know, I was certainly outnumbered by the Aussies, that is for sure. But there again, it was their television station. That's, you know, that's how it works. But I had a fantastic time. Uh, and we get to the final. This time it's Pakistan against England at the MCG. Packed house, brilliant atmosphere. And England had been, you know, even as a, an English observer, I, the rest of the world, I think, would agree that England in that tournament had been the best team throughout the two months of that tournament. And we all know the history. We all know, we all know that Pakistan should have been obliterated at Adelaide when the rain saved them. 
you know, was, you know, all out for about three, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, that happened. And somehow they survived. So we had the cornered Tigers line, which was great from Imran. And, you know, had some, I mean, uh, full respect to Imran because he you know, has that quality of leadership, which um, you know, few have that ability to sort of turn things around like that. I mean, he was lucky, yes, because the Adelaide thing went his way. After that, of course, they built their momentum. And they, you know, there were moments in that final at the MCG where, you know, there were turning points, um, which everyone looks back on. It could have been different. So that really should have been... Sure. Well, in fact, both 87 and 92, England should really have won both competitions, both World Cups. And the fact we had to wait until last year, well, I guess in the end it was worth it. And I have to say this, Owen Morgan, I have a lot of time, a lot of respect for Owen Morgan. I think he is a brilliant, brilliant one-day captain. If you meet him, he's a very impressive character. Um, and that was basically the culmination of four years of very impressive hard work. Better late than never. Yeah, and well, who knows? Maybe next time we can you know, try and do it again. But yeah, it is, is all it about those moments, you know. Final then. Hmm? It's in India, so maybe India England final. I'd take that. I would happily <laughs> take that. All right. The next question is a very, very important question because from 1970s to today, the cricket has seen unprecedented growth and has taken mm. some major steps. We have seen cricket evolving. We have seen T10, T20 leagues coming. We were seeing that England was all set to host uh, the hundreds this year. Unfortunately, happening. But do you see cricket going in the right direction? Do you see it evolving in the right direction? Are we doing justice to the purest form of the game, that is Test cricket? Well, there are a lot of people still doing it justice. Yeah, um, I mean, when when we had India here, when we hosted India here two or three seasons ago now. Um, one of the most important things I thought about that was that, first of all, well, first of all, we had a great test series. Secondly, Virat Kohli, as you know, the leading player in the world, made the point very clearly that he sees test cricket as the toughest form of the game, the most important form of the game to him, which is a you know, huge PR from you know, the captain of India to make that point. Um, and I think we're, we're in a situation at the moment where I sense that a lot of people will follow test cricket. And a lot of people will understand the value of test cricket. Um, they don't necessarily all go to grounds to watch it. Because you can imagine you know, around the world, an individual is going to have to spend money to go and watch cricket. He has a choice to make. Do I go and watch test cricket? Maybe an ODI, maybe a T20 international, maybe an IPL match, that sort of thing. And if you haven't got the, shall we say, the finance, the budget, the ability, the time to go and see everything, then you pick one. So I think we accept, I think you know, everyone around the world accepts that there is a very strong theme of entertainment, which means that the public will vote with their with their feet, if you want to put it that way. You know, if they arrive at the ground, that means they want to be there. So you have to put in front of them what they want. Um, and if we can do that, which includes obviously T20, IPL, um, you know, the 100 for the ECB, uh, it's going to be an interesting thing if it ever gets started. Uh, and whether or it not it's... Be. Yeah, I mean, whether or not it ever gets traction remains yeah. to be seen. But, you know, because, of course, T20 has been so successful around the world, you know, the, so the, the number of T20 leagues um, and the popularity means it is technically a success. So if that's what the public wants to watch, fine. You have to put that in front of them and say, here's your... You know, this is how you do it. I think they when the... The one thing to try and do is to try and limit it for two reasons. One is that if you had, you know, if you, for instance, had IPL in front of you 50 weeks a year, it would become potentially dull. The fact that it's six weeks, you have the intensity of that six weeks, you have all these world, you know, these great players from around the world being part of it, um, you know, and it has good crowds because it is limited to that six weeks. Um, the fact that a lot of those players can then go and play, say, in Australia, um, in the Big Bash, uh, in the Blast in the UK, some of them, in the West Indies, in Pakistan, you know, wherever, you know, there's so many T20 leagues. Okay, somewhere there's always something going on. Um, but at the same time, if you can, as it were, give time to everything, and at, at least in the UK, and I think, you know, for instance, in India, when 
you know, if, for instance, you know, England is due to be there this coming winter, um, God knows exactly when that might happen or what the schedule might be or what's going to happen between now and then, but let's assume it happens. Um, you know, there'll be a lot of interest in that test series. There'll be interest in the one day internationals that are part of it too. And you know, that's, that's good. I mean, as long as there is something for everyone and you right. know, for instance, pe people of my generation, uh, ex players like me will always say that they look back and I look back on whatever statistic you quote at me about my career. I will look first of all at my test match runs, my test match average, my test match hundreds. And if you Absolutely. ask me for my favorite moments in my career, they will all involve test matches. And that's that's the way I am. And that's the way, it, for me, it has to be. And that's my next question, David. We mm. talked about the public side of it. Now I want to talk about the player side of it because I see a lot of young generation keeping side the test cricket, focusing more on the one-day internationals and the T20Is. Mm. You playing the sport 117 tests. Now that requires some fitness. Now we see a lot of cricket today and not able to do yo-yo test, not able to clear yo-yo test. How do you think the match is going? Um, I'm not quite sure what you're after, really. The um, When you say, how do you think the match is going? Um, it, I mean, I've, I last time I was in India, one of the recent, relatively recent visit to India, I was in Chennai for a few days, um, very well entertained and giving a, a lecture down there. And as part of that trip, I spoke to one of the youth teams, one of the best youth teams in Chennai. And they were hugely enthusiastic, um, really wanted to listen, which was great. Um, but one of the questions was, how do I make 100? And the easy answer to that is you just have to stay there long enough to make 100. But the problem was that they were playing, they weren't playing what they used to, which was a whole day game. They were playing 20 overs. So if a very talented young player of, say, 18, 19, 20 years old is playing only 20 over cricket and he thinks, I want to make 100 here, well, actually, he's going to have to play mighty well in a very, very defined one day T20 style. And so he's right. not going to be given the opportunity to learn in those circumstances to learn how to bat for half a day or a full day or a day and a half. And yet, of course, if you look back through the history of the game in India, uh, Ranji Trophy, Test Matches, you know, there are people like my great friend Sunil Gavaskar making thousands of runs. There are people like you know, Sachin Tendulkar, the great Sachin, making thousands of runs. Uh, you know, Virat Kohli will make even more thousands of runs in all forms of the game because he is a simply brilliant player. And he, you know, he knows how to occupy a crease and how to manoeuvre a ball in Test Match cricket. But he's had to learn it you know, in his fashion. Um, so, I mean, I, I sympathise with, say, those young cricketers who need to be able to play you know, a longer form of the game as they're growing up to okay. to understand how these things work. Because the only way you, you know, do actually get there is by having the opportunity. So, you know, if you're not batting number one in the T20, how are you going to get 100? You know, if you're coming in at number five and, you know, 15 overs, of, yeah, well five, ten overs have gone, no way, right. you know, you're, you're happy with, you know, 40 from 20 balls. So, um, there, I mean, there, there, there are obviously, obviously problems with that if you're trying to learn the game. Um, and yet, you know, when we came to India last, um, there was someone making 300. Karen and I was making 300, just like that, you know, played, <laughs> played beautifully. We, you know, without being rude about him, we'd never seen him before. He gets picked in the side and just quit, quietly makes 300. So obviously, you know, it is possible to learn or to have that ability. And of course, the temperament up there, you know, the, the, the brain is a mighty important part of the kit of any international or any cricketer. Absolutely. And I appreciate that. Now, uh, David, I want to ask you that IPL has definitely changed the dynamics of how cricket is seen in the world be it stakeholders, mm -hmm. be it broadcasters, franchise owners. But that is one side of it. When it comes to the player side of it, is it also exposing the grey areas of a cricketer? Um, I think in, I think overall, IPL has been very good for cricketers. Um, because um, for both for the homegrown players who are part of IPL and for the international players, 
Um, there is that huge intensity of that T20 game played in front of very intense crowds. Um, so ever since the short form of the game, i.e. the original one day game was invented, ever since people have refined it year by year by year, and ever since the games have got shorter, things like, for instance, I mean, fielding has become incredible. Some of the things you see these people do now as fielders with the extra fitness, extra strength, mobility, um, you know, some brilliant catches taken. You know, it's huge athleticism is shown by all these players. Now, and I have to say, I think T20 has changed a lot since the first days of the IPL when, you know, IPL was taking some of the great players from around the world at the end of their careers. You know, so the bones were creaking, the fingers were a bit stiff. Um, you know, great. It was the perfect thing to do days to give it some impetus and to get some great names involved. But now you want the young players. Now you want, I mean, friends, if you're looking for English players as an example, you want Ben Stokes because he is, you know, box office. He is absolutely brilliant. Uh, you want Josh Butler because he's brilliant at that form of the game. Um, and one or two of the others that have played, like uh, Johnny Best, you know, they've all, they've got things to offer now that IPL finally is happy to accept. So, but the thing is that you are under, you know, it might not be international cricket, it might not be county cricket, it might not be state cricket, it might not be. But each team, each franchise is taking that hugely seriously. So you bond together briefly. You have your six, seven weeks together as a team in IPL. Um, if it goes well, you make the playoffs and all the rest of it. But, you know, there is a whole intensity, which is, I think, a really good training ground. And one of the things that um, a very interesting character of ours, a fellow called Kevin Peterson, made early on was that he saw the value in IPL as a training ground for everyone, not just Indians, not just, um, you know, the established international players, but anyone being part of that would learn a lot about the game. And I think that is where the, the real value lies to all the people who take part in it. OK, it's not going to teach you to play test cricket. And I still go back to the, the other point. I would still say that um, for test players, their satisfaction is infinitely more um, well, satisfying than it is for uh, ODI players or T20 players. Yes, everyone's doing a job. And um, in that, of course, you cannot ignore the fact that the best players in IPL are paid absolutely brilliantly. Um, and that is their big incentive. You know, I mean, they, you know, it's 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 a fantastic thing to have. It's a fantastic opportunity. So even if you are, and I'll use an example here, Karen Pollard, who is you know, one of the world's best T20 players and has made a very successful career in IPL and elsewhere by being good at T20. And he's got all the attributes. You know, he's an extraordinary player. But he knows as much as, as well as I do that he cannot play test cricket. He's not good enough to play test cricket. Absolutely. Yeah, that is, it's as simple as that. Um, so someone else will play Test Group for the West Indies. And someone else playing Test Group for the West Indies won't make as much money as Karen Pollard. But that is just, I'm afraid, that is just the way of the world. So, yeah, everyone has to exist side by side. Um, I'm very easy with that, very comfortable with that. Um, and I respect these guys for what they can do. Um, and I respect them for their career choices. And of course, you can understand because of that, you know, with IPL being so big, if you're, again, those young players back in Chennai that I spoke to, you know, if they're thinking, you know, are they going to become part of the, you know, I was a guest of Sanmar, a lovely company, very good company down in Chennai. If they're going to be part of that Sanmar company, which is a huge, very broad and very successful company and very well run, there's a career. But if they want to be cricketers, you know, if they decide, OK, well, you know, first of all, I'd like to try and play cricket and try and be part of IPL. Well, you know, they've got to be brilliant before they're earning a million dollars. Um, you know, they might, you know, if they they've got to be mighty good to earn $20,000. You know, that it's, it's you know, again, the, the economies reflect the abilities. Um, but at least it's there. At least it, you know, it is a fantastic opportunity for those who are good enough. Superbly answered. I think the dynamics has changed, actually. Uh, David, my last question to you before we move to the rapid fire round. If yeah. I ask you to create the best Test eleven current, Oof. what will it be and why? Oh, I can't do it. I can never do these things. Um, <laughs> Who's in? I mean, I, I can I can throw a few names out because I mean there are you know, I've mentioned I've mentioned one already. So the, you know, the leading all rounder is Ben Stokes. So Ben is in there at do we say number five? Um, it's interesting to see who you're going to have. Who's going to who's going to open innings? Um, but there are people like I mean the obvious ones are I mean Ben Stokes, Virat Kohli, two instant picks, no thought needed. Um, I would have Joe Root. 
I would have Kane Williamson. I would have Steve right. Smith. Um, I haven't worried about. I'm not worried about a batting order yet. Um, that... I would have. Um, who else have we got that I might pick from? You know, I've got some of the Australian bowlers, like for instance Pat Cummins. I'd stick him in. Uh, I'd probably get Shane Warne out of retirement to bowl. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that, every time, we, that, even though he's about, even though he's about three thousand years old. Hmm? Sorry. I'm saying that means we are lack of good spin bowlers at the current time. Well, no, I just, I just, I find Shane an extraordinary character. But of the, of the guys who are playing nowadays, who's the best spinner in the world? Possibly. I mean, it's, it's probably an interesting one between Ashwin and Nathan Lyon, I would say. Because um, I think they're both good off spinners. Um, you could take a punt with one of the leggies, you know, one of the sort of the Asian leggies who've been so well with, done so well in IPL. But you know, Test cricket, of course, is a uh, a very different game. I do like leg spin because of the the very special skills that it comes with. So I might look at one of the leggies who are currently doing well in in the shorter forms of the game. Um, but yeah, pace has always been important. So Pat Cummins, I thought, was outstanding here last year. Loved watching him. Very very good competitor. Um, right. We need to think about a wicket keeper. A wicket keeper. Hmm? A wicket keeper. Yeah, I mean, I who's the best in the world at the moment? I would sort of there might be a bit of bias here. I mean, I think I mean I might. I am a big Joss Butler fan. Uh, I'm also hugely aware that he hasn't made the runs in Test match cricket that he should do, um, and I'm really hoping that you know, that will change. But obviously, time does run out on people. But we're we're very blessed. I think we're very blessed in England with very good keepers. And that's just you know, there might be a bit of you know, national bias in that, but if if there is, Butler's a very good keeper, Bester's a very good keeper, Ben Folks is an even better keeper. Right. And if you're picking someone, if you're picking any of those purely on keeping, the word around this country is that Ben Folks is the better keeper. So, um, I, 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 it it always takes me an awful long time to sit down and sort of throw names around and think about it, and yeah, you, know, you could we'll be you could go. You could go to sleep. You could go to bed. Have a night off. I'll come back in the morning. And I'll have a tea for you. But, yeah. Anyway, I've thrown a, I've thrown a few names at you. Who will be your captain? And then we will let it go. All right. Okay. Um, my captain is going to be Virat. Okay. Well, okay. Oh, you, you might you might think I am playing to an audience here. Um, I just I mean I. I think, for instance, that if you look around the world, I mean, Kane Williamson um, would be my contender there because I think Kane is a very level-headed cricketer, very talented cricketer, uh, you know, and also you know a very, very together character. Because you know, if you look at that World Cup final last year; they took that loss. Yeah. I mean, unbelievably well. I mean, they handled themselves. The Kiwis handled themselves unbelievably well when they you know, knew they could have won that game. Knew they were you know. 12 inches, 18 inches away from winning the World Cup. Um, you know, it was, a, it was the most extraordinary day. So Kane, I have a lot of respect for him. I think maybe you know, if if I'm wrong with Virat, then Kane is my next choice because I think Joe Root is a, a good captain, but not as good as the others. Um, and I think Virat, what I like about Virat, apart from his obvious talents, um, and this is sort of a two-edged thing. I like his passion. I like his absolute drive. Um, you know, sometimes it goes or it looks as though it goes a little bit too far. If I can put it that way, you know, he gets a bit carried away with himself, and he needs someone to sort of tap him on the shoulder, saying, "You know, calm down. You know, we've got this." Um, but I, I like that sort of passion. I always, always when I've been watching other sports, um, you know, I love, I like both sides. I like, for instance, if you look at tennis, I like the control and the grace and the absolute sublime skills of someone like Roger Federer. Equally so, in the era before him, I used to love watching John McEnroe. And no one's going to tell me that John McEnroe had everything under control all the time. I mean, he was, you know, he was a very hot-headed individual. I mean, that headband he used to wear was just to keep his hair on. I mean, that was literally to keep his hair on. So, I completely understand that point. You will not believe in one of the press conferences I was having a word with Virat. And I, I just said that, Virat, tell me one thing. What makes, uh, take best out of you on field? And he was like, this, this. Yeah. Just, just the name. That's, just the, well, that's... Nothing I know, that's a great. It's a great thing to say because 
you know, there are so many, um, so many things that drive individuals. I mean, there's your own sort of personal pride, your own ambition. Your cricket is at least is still one of those games where you can be an individual in a team, um, and if the balance goes wrong and you are too much of the individual, of course, that's not healthy. But if you're a brilliant individual contributing to a team, and I'd have to say that Virat falls very firmly into that category. Um, if that thing on, if that badge on your shirt is what drives you most, that's a very, very good thing to have. Um, and I think you know, pride in your country, pride in your team, is the ultimate driving force. Absolutely. Let's move to the rapid fire round. Okay. First one on your way. I will not give you much time on that. Favorite cricketer from the current times? Is it still Virat? Um. Uh, I have a huge admiration for Virat. I'm going to say Ben Stokes. All right. Your favorite Indian dish? I will. Uh, favorite Indian dish is um, a slow cooked lamb or a mutton um, jalfrezi, something like that. All right. Your favorite Bollywood star? Well, uh, to be fair, I haven't watched an awful lot of Bollywood uh, movies. The only one I've met is Shah Rukh. So Shah Rukh Khan, who I met at um, Calcutta, Calcutta the other night, well, a year ago or so now, is now, of course, my favourite hot Bollywood star. All right. You have smashed boundary on the first test ball you ever faced against Pakistan. Who was the bowler? Liaquat Ali. Wow. In which year did you win your Wisden Cricketer of the Year? Uh, that was 78, uh, would have been in the wisdom of 79. Wow. Define the feeling one word to be named in England's greatest Test 11. Pride. Your best stint as a commentator. Wow. Um, Oh, best in as a commentator. Oh, that's, I have no idea. Um, the, the, the proudest, the proudest thing. Okay, here's, here's a slightly quirky answer. Um, there was an incident in Brisbane, probably six, seven, eight years ago now, where Nasser Hussain put a chair on my foot as we were changing over the commentary. It hurt. Uh, all I said was something like, ah, um, it could easily have been something a lot worse. So I'm very, very happy that at that moment of extreme pressure, uh, that the only noise that came out of my mouth was not defamatory or rude. It, <laughs> it turned out well in the end. Well, I managed to keep the job for a few more years anyway. <laughs> okay, so tell me one Indian player you have loved to play against. There are plenty, to be honest. Um, Kapil Dev. All right. One player you have loved to play with. Uh, Ian Botham. All right. Last one. Your fondest memory from the cricketing field. Uh, fondest memory, proudest memory is standing on the Oval Balcony in 1985 as England's captain with a record number of runs to my name for a series and with the Ashes in hand won. as the man who won the Ashes or as the man who led the team who won the Ashes. I would never claim individual responsibility for winning the Ashes. Wow, what an answer. Thank you so much, David, for speaking to us. I'm glad that you took, gave me this time. It means a lot to me and everyone at Sports Tiger. Please take care of yourself and I hope you had a good time. Well, my pleasure. Uh, my best wishes to you. My best wishes to all Indian cricket fans. And uh, I hope to be there as soon as I can. If there is cricket there between India and England next winter, that would be fantastic. And I'll definitely be there in some capacity. And if there's any work out there, please let me know. Definitely, definitely. We would love to have you. Okay, My pleasure. Take care. Take care. Goodbye. You and Sachin Tendulkar have something in common. Sachin Tendulkar, before starting his career, was a ball boy. I don't know whether you know this or not. And you being the ball girl in the World Cup final, which was held at Eden Gardens. So, how did it all start? And uh, uh, I was just standing in front of the uh, main gate of uh, Cricket Association of Bengal. And somebody asked me, you are a ball girl, come inside. And I said, okay. okay. And Papa said, okay, I'll meet you there after the match over here only. I said, okay. 